um, and we're excited uh, to welcome everybody uh, to the first talk. Um, really, we wanted to frame these around several different topics that a lot of the artists in the biennial touch upon. So this is a little bit of an introduction. Embodiments of love and diasporic stories. In this talk, we hope to lean into the conversations of the way in which materials and stories are embodied, uh, which is one of the core themes with the Bronx Calling Fifth Biennial. Uh, the discussion will be about the details and specific works of the relationship between the artist, the artworks, and the viewers and us. Um, so I'll read off, uh, I'll start off with the bios of the artist presenting today. Uh, Gina Goiko is a multidisciplinary artist, educator, and self-proclaimed Nesia. Through their work, Goiko navigates their identity in the spaces where they exist in the Dominican Republic and the United States. Through their career, they have come to create a diverse body of work that ranges from embroidery and installation, ink, drawings, performance, Goiko also facilitates spaces of temporary communities and dialogues for healing and in healing in the current status quo. Uh, Estelle Maisonet, also joining us this evening, is a Mexican Puerto Rican mixed media interdisciplinary artist, born and raised in the Bronx, New York. Her work is an investigation of how personal relationships to objects and materials inform preconceived notions of identity economic status, accessibility, race, sexual orientation, and gender. Uh, Victoria Udondien's uh, work is driven by her interest in textiles, potential for clothing, for clothing to shape identity and form histories, um, tactic meanings embedded in everyday materials. In 2020, she was named a Guggenheim Fellow. She has been exhibited internationally. And today's panel will be moderated by Monica Fabianska, an independent art historian and curator based in New York City. She specializes in women's and feminist art. In 2021, she curated the critically acclaimed Betsy Damon Passages, Rites and Rituals at La Mama Galleria's. Uh, mentioned in the New York Times as the best shows of 2021. Her exhibition, Ecofeminisms, at Tom Thurman Gallery in 2020, featured works by Agnes Baines and Hertzman Leeson, Mary Mattingly, Anna Mandieta, Cecilia Vincuña. Uh, it was reviewed in Arts in America, the New York Times, and the Brooklyn Rail, Hyperallergic and Flash Arts, among others. Uh, we're very excited um, to be working with uh, Monica. She has also mentored the Bronx Museum Inc. Fellows since 2019. Um, uh, Ian. Yeah, and I just wanted to add, I am Ian Coffrey, the co-curator of Bronx Museum by Hill, Bronx Calling. Um, the other talks are on February 16th and February 23rd, Wednesdays at 6 p.m. for the uh, rest of this month of February. So please go to brontemiantmuseum.org, register, and join us for those other conversations. Thanks, and now on to Monica Fabianska. Thank you. I just came from the museum today, so I have a very fresh uh, memory and idea of the exhibition, and it's never an easy exhibition to curate, uh, I have to say, because even unlike the Biennial, which is a broad survey where it's uneasy to, to put one uh, subject or geography or any other similarity, uh, here you actually deal with artists uh, belonging to one group, people who participated in a certain program, and how do you put it together? So I think that Ian and Eva or Eva and Ian uh, really uh, made a great job there. And it's really worth going and seeing. Uh, the exhibition this year is enormous because of COVID. Uh, two um, groups, 2018 fellows and 2019 are presented together. Um, I don't have a very long history with, um, with the program, but for the past three years, I've been uh, offering workshops and conversations about curatorial practices and uh, 
relationships between artists and curators. And we've been experimenting with a lot. Uh, it was very nurturing for me and I am extremely privileged and happy and honored and uh, to be able to talk with uh, three wonderful artists today. Uh, it is a very enriching experience for a curator always to be invited to moderate such a conversation. I should probably mention that I'm a Bronxian, not born here, but the past eight years of my life uh, have been spent here and it became home. And it is a home. So I'm in the Bronx, the land of Lenape people. And uh, I hope we will, we will enjoy um, looking into the work of Gina, Estelle and Victoria, to get Victoria together. I think we should start in a very simple way because the exhibition is our anchor for the conversation and the works there were, were selected by Eva and Ian. So maybe we should just discuss the works that you show in the Bronx Calling exhibition and we'll take it from there. Uh, let's do that in alphabetical order. So why don't you start, Gina? Thank you, Monica. Okay, so I'm gonna share my screen right now so you can see if you haven't seen yet in the museum what's going on. Okay, so uh, the piece that I have currently in the museum is called Loving Suits, which is part of a developing project which encompasses soft-weighted sculptures and multimedia documentation of Dominican feminized folks narratives around family dynamics, love and self-love. So these pieces showcased here in the museum are three soft-weighted sculptures. So these are the sculptures over here. You can see it closer over here. Um, that these are the suits that I talk about and an eight minute loop video with five narratives that I interweaved uh, from these people that I interview and a final statement uh, that I put in the video regarding love from my point of view. So this is the video over here. There's also the set of indexed cards that are printed um, where the audience is invited to participate and respond to the prompt that uh, the people in the video are responding to which is what is your first memory of love? So let me go a little bit more into like the soft weighted sculptures over here. These are wearable. So please, if you're in the museum, you can engage with them. Uh, please, uh, hand sanitizer always. Um, and these are filled with um, plastic beads, the plastic beads that are in weighted blankets and also have plush. So also, Sometimes, last time I, I went there and I, I anointed them again, but they're supposed to smell like uh, lavender, rosemary, and frankincense. Um, and the design of each one of these sculptures is uh, thinking about pressure points in the body, in the upper body, um, so you can suit tension and provide comfort. So in regards to the narratives that are here, I mean, okay. So, oh, by the way, these are some of the indexed cards that I have collected. I am collecting them and I'm going to create this whole index of Bronx sites that have gone to the museum and engaged with this. Well, not only Bronx sites, I, I, people from New York City <laughs> that have engaged with this work. Um, so these narratives that are in the video are recorded interviews that aim to capture multi-generational experiences of Dominican feminized folks. And I aim to get people from diverse households and with different migration stories. And I'm thinking about these narratives as a space of the digestion, right? Like thinking about how, or like when and where this loving suits us and how we reproduce dynamics of care for others. Um, or is there like real love, like decolonial love in our family dynamics? And I am focused on loving and I'm going to take that, like this is bell hooks, totally. Um, inspiring me, um, how love is this force and action that once it is captured and understood collectively without the colonial violent legacy that permeates our family dynamics and our generational trauma, we can attain liberation. I know this is like really me going up there, but you know, what tries? So these narratives uh, spoken within temporary communities that um, these folks are engaged with um, in this interview settings that four or five people together talking um, allow us to relate and hold space for collective envisioning. 
Um, and just so you know, some of these interviews, because of course I started this work in 2019 and COVID happened, um, I went to the digital realm. So some of the narratives contained in this video, I actually did online. So I provided like this virtual space and Zoom. And since people couldn't interact with the actual suits, I taught people how to use um, with household items. This was like right at the beginning when we couldn't like really go out. Um, using tea and old socks or old like t-shirts, how to create their own loving uh, suits at home. So yeah, that's that's what's up. Let me stop sharing. Thank you. I um, I was fascinated by the term that you used, and I think it's such a such a good and um, useful term for us all, feminized folks, uh, which uh, has. Uh, can can you explain it? Just in, I don't want to enter your vocabulary, but I think that somebody in the audience might be interested in exactly what you mean when yeah, you say so, that. Thank you. And we had that conversation. Thank you for pointing that out. So when I uh, speak about feminized folks, um, I'm talking about people that either society uh, perceives them as femme. So it's not necessarily even about self-identification. So I come from the Dominican Republic. And in the Dominican Republic, even if you are like a cis straight man, but you have certain like femme mannerisms, or even the way maybe that you um, relate to other femmes, you might be read as feminized. Or folks that are, um, you know, like read as maybe they have a vagina, they will be feminized. So these are things that it's really tricky and in the context, like also changes in context. So I'm thinking, and this is why like I talk to people, um, even if they're non-binary, how did you relate in the household? Like how did your mom or your dad or whoever was your parental figure um, related to you? Did you use like to perform feminized quote unquote traditional tasks like cleaning the, like, the whole house and cleaning the plates because Sometimes you're in like in a house with five like cis men and because I don't know, you're like the more femme, you're like, you're the one that's going to be cleaning the whole house and helping the other brothers. So this is why it's like a tricky thing. And I use feminized folks and it's really like contextual for the culture and maybe it translates to other cultures. Thank you. Yeah, I, I thought that it was very useful uh, to have you explain it also because it immediately puts us in reading queerness or gender identification within the context of postcolonialism, which is specific, like it, which adds another layer to this experience. Uh, Estelle, uh, you can easily take from this from here to uh, talk about your work in the show. Yeah, thank you, Gina. <laughs> um, I'm Estami Sinet, um, and I'm going to show you first the two pieces that are in the Bronx Museum show. Um, I'm born and raised in the Bronx, and so my work is largely inspired by the Bronx. And I'm going to get into a little bit about that just because it relates to the, oh, I'm sharing the slideshow and not my screen. Sorry, y'all. Um, here we go. Okay, and let me just hit, okay, here we go. So um, the first piece that's in a show, in the show is from 2015, and it's called Shopping on a Rainy Day. Um, it's quite small compared to my usual works, which are um, scaled to life. Um, but this was really part of the first series where I started using found objects. Um, and what really attracted me to found objects was uh, or trash, as I like to call it, was, was firstly is that it was something that was readily available, uh, especially in New York, especially in the Bronx. Um, and it felt like a footprint or a trace um, of a community that kind of gave insight into who may have been there, uh, what's consumed in the area, what is what we have access to in the area, um, and just being interested in how the trash or what was left behind kind of shifted as I moved through neighborhoods, as I moved... Um, through boroughs, you know, or even through states. Um, but this piece, Shopping on a Rainy Day, was really that first interaction. Um, and I'm also interested in materiality. So um, this piece, I was really excited about trying to make cardboard look like concrete. Um, 
And so it's cardboard uh, with a found paper bag and leaves. Um, so that's the first piece that's in the show. And the second piece. Can you, can you tell what's the title of the work? Oh, no. <laughs> titles, are titles are important for you, so. Yeah, I, uh, shopping on a rainy day. Yeah. So, and here we go. Okay, so this is pink. I actually made this recently, um, 2021 at a residency in Florida. Very different in terms of what's left behind. Uh, and so sourcing materials. So normally I'm sourcing materials from the community. So there's found objects, which I get off the ground, but then there's people give me clothing uh, and I also take photographs. And my work is really a combination of all those things, photography, sculpture, painting, printmaking. Um, and I'm really interested in how we read those things differently, but also how we read clothing differently. Um, so this piece is called Pink. There's some Victoria Pink underwear. And um, I was specifically interested in gender, um, mostly because my own identity and sexual orientation and how that's often like a point of conversation. Um, like, what does it mean to look queer? What does it mean to look straight? Um, and also always being asked why my figures are predominantly masculine. So including underwear became a way to like kind of play with gender and also combining both uh, like clothing that's made for both men and women. Um, so yeah, this was a piece found objects from Florida, uh, faux grass, which is very popular in Florida, which I thought was like funny because there's such a big opportunity to grow real plants in Florida, except it becomes an expense uh, like with upkeep. So I continued to find kind of fake grass and fake plants um, in Florida, which I felt told me a lot about the aesthetics of Florida. And <laughs> like, I started to think about like how value is created, um, like when something is embodying the real and what that means to me as an artist, uh, aesthetic versus like reality, uh, what's deeper than that. And so again, like always trying to go beyond the facade and kind of playing with this trompe of um, our perception. How do we perceive both materials, gender, identity, um, whatever comes to mind. And I think that happens when we have real clothing um, or we have a figure that's void of the human body. We often wanna think about who it might be, or I guess that's uh, the first assumption for a lot of people. Um, they start to think of a person either that they know or uh, that they associate with the brands or sizes of the way or the spaces that they occupy. So yeah, those are my two pieces in the show. Thank you. Victoria? Oh, you're muted, Victoria. <laughs> hey, thank you. <laughs> yeah, Zoom issues. Yeah, thank you very much. So I'll start with um, sharing my screen just to share the work I have in the show. Just give me a moment to do that. Um, there you go. Um, so I have this Sony piece I have in the show, which is an installation that has different parts. Um, so this piece that is titled Akai Seng, which is an Ibibio word that would translate for the traveler or the walker, or you know, depending on context of usage. Um, this piece is a part of a larger body of work I have been working on for the past, um, I would say at this point, two to three years now. And so in 2017, I started my process of naturalizing in America. And um, you know, the frustration of the bureaucratic process of going through that um, was very, very, um, I struggled with it quite a bit. And I decided to channel that frustration into an art project. So I started a project in 2017 titled um, The Republic of a Known Territory, um, which was a project that I subverted the gallery space into some kind of a micro nation and had, um, visitors to the gallery go through some immigration process to gain access into the show to see the exhibition. Um, it was quite an interesting experience. I didn't expect that I would have people who would resist um, the boundaries that we had set in the space. Um, and eventually actually had someone write to the gallery complaining that they were denied access because I performed in this show as um, 
as, as a border officer and I, you know, I interviewed visitors and I granted visas at my own subjective whims. And so after working on this first phase of this project, I wanted to expand the work into, um, you know, to bring into the community. I wanted other people with shared experiences to be a part of this project. So I had a call out at the time, I was doing a residency at Project for Empty Space. And so I had a call out for volunteers who were immigrants or first generation Americans to come to my, into my studio and share their stories and, you know, share their migration story, family story, whatever stories they wanted to share. But at the same time, I would create cast of their hands and also created those forms, um, you know, that re references the body. So all of the, the images um, that we're looking at, the forms we're looking at, were actually made from human bodies, some from my body, some from bodies of my collaborators, as well as the, um, the hands in the, in the pieces on the bottom or on the floor, were also live cast of hands of my collaborators. And so this piece sort of speaks to presence and absence. You know, when you begin to think about notions of immigration, that a bunch of people who are having to, you know, there's also questions of erasure. People who have to hide as a result of um, immigration statuses in the country. And at the same time, thinking about, you know, several lives that have been lost in the course of migration, whether it's forced migration or voluntary migration. Um, and so as part of um, the project, I'm now creating like a large um, sculptural piece where I'm working and, you know, bringing this hand, all of these casted hands into a large um, constructed ship rip, um, you know, which, you know, um, the ship rip itself references like the, you know, the Brooke slave ship from the UK, but also alludes to the migrant ship that keeps languishing on the Mediterranean Sea. Um, so I'm very interested in, um, you know, in this work, I'm interested in um, you know, notions of migration. I'm interested in highlighting stories, um, the contributions of immigrants and the society, and all of these projects tend, tend to, to speak to that. Um, this is a detail just for context of the piece on the floor, um, which is a combination of, you know, the live casted hands, um, collected flowers from thrift tools. I work with a lot of repurposed material. I'm very interested in textile. I'm interested in, um, you know, um, secondhand clothing, you know, as an artist who grew up in Nigeria that has a huge influx of secondhand clothing in Africa, I'm interested in this global trust system and how um, dominant culture, the West, for example, impacts subdominant, um, subdominant culture. Um, and so as we, you know, get along, I probably will talk more about this project. Um, also would like to mention that all of these pieces, the entire body of work, it's coming together now. And I have a solution that opens on March 5th at the Smart Melon, where all of these bodies of work is finally coming together in this solo exhibition. So I'll stop there for now. Perfect moment for our conversation to give light to the show congrats um yeah i was thinking at the museum today looking at this work that it has incredible power in capturing the invisibility of immigrants it's really like this this group of ghosts it's, it's very moving and um it really transpires it speaks on a very um direct level about this um as i've been focused for many years on curating feminist and women's work i've been uh, and I often call it emergency art history, trying to save, uh, you know, uh, biographies, stories and bodies of works that have not been looked into for several decades and that are prone to be to be lost entirely. And I uh, realized that the key actually is not just to focus on on introducing singular women artists into into the canon, but actually on focusing on the subject themes and perspectives uh, that are just different from whatever was uh, uh, recorded in mainstream culture. And I was thinking, uh, we spoke uh, a couple of days ago about your works, and I noticed that all three of you within the last year or two uh, made a work about motherly love, 
about motherhood in general. And I was thinking that uh, when we think of history of art, uh, you know, there are certain codified uh, ways of dealing with the subject of motherhood uh, in West painting, that would be Madonna, for example, with a child. But you know, this kind of presentation is a presentation of an heir, a presentation of a future king. How, you, the, how the three of you approach the subject of motherly love, uh, in the context of violence, uh, state violence, gang violence, uh, or uh, cultural violence that goes back uh, through generations and is also colonially uh, um, branded. Uh, it was fascinating to me. And I was, I thought of it already um, in the end of last week, but then of course we learned about what happened in Minneapolis, which gives to this question uh, even more, um, poignant context, another mother in this country lost her black boy uh, to violence. And your works are not about police killings, but I wanted you to speak about uh, how, how you approached uh, motherhood and the separation of mother and child in your works. Who wants to start? We don't have to go alphabetically, however you want. I mean, I can go first. Um, <laughs> I mean, for me, I think um, I'd like to look at the body, this particular, I would like to look at it in the context of this body of work that I've been immersed in the last two to three years. And, um, you know, this, um, I'm going to share my screen again just so I can share images as I'm talking. Um, So this body of work, I have about the several, several of these boxes, I have about six of them. And just for context, at the time I made this work, um, it was during the Trump presidency and there was a lot of vilification of immigrants. And at the time we also had kids, there was this whole um, media reporting about kids in cages. And so some of this work were, you know, sort of made to, you know, look into all of these stories that were going on. You know, thinking about motherhood and thinking about having kids in cages was one of the things that you would think as unspeakable um, in a society, in a developed society like America. But here we are in 2020, in 2019, we, you know, we, that was the, you know, the status quo. And so some of this work, I've also collected cast of hands of babies, of young children. And so I have some of the boxes that actually has that. And that was me responding to, you know, thinking about kids in, in, in um, behind the walls, children in cages. But also overall, this you know, piece was also thinking about the various system, contemporary system, um, neo-colonial system of repression that black and brown bodies constantly have to go through in this country. Um, and just to, you know, for a bit of context, I'd like to read a quote, if it's all right, um, from Angela Davis and Gina Dent um, from a text called Prison as a Border. And, and the text goes thus, we continue to find that the prison is itself a border. This analysis has come from prisoners who named the distinction between the free world and the space behind the walls of the prison. This is an important interpretation that undoes the illusion of the powerful nation state on the one hand, and the seeming disorganization and chaos of capital travel on the other. There is a very specific political economy of the prison that brings the intersection of gender and race, colonialism and capitalism into view. So I'm, 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 I'm you know, I was very interested in this text because, um, you know, I'm all. In my work, I'm invested in, in this particular project mostly in thinking about the intersectionality of all of these subjects, how, you know, um, neocolonial system really is, you know, you know, repressive system set up the structures that continue continually represses, um, you know, a certain group of people, you know, marginalized group of people. Um, and I think that's the one thing that I also want to highlight in this project. I do want to share another um, image, which is, um, you know, I feel very vulnerable sharing this. This is a work in progress, but I just want to give us a little bit of idea, an idea how this work is developing. And so all of the hands I've been collecting, you know, is installed in this um, ship rip. And like I mentioned earlier on, this ship rip, was actually made to reference um, the Brooks left ship because I was interested in bringing the slag narrative into this work, which was also some forced migration. And also thinking about um, the, you know, 
various um, sh um, migrant ships that keeps languishing on the Mediterranean Sea. And so part of this work is done, most of the hands are casted in black and brown. I also have some national colors. So the different col um, countries where most of my collaborators come from is reflected with their national flag. Um, and so in this piece, I'm, you know, I'm interested in highlighting all of this, um, you know, the constant repression that this new colonial system is, is you know, um, sort of reinforcing. It's, it's, it's hard to think about um, what kind of trauma separation between a mother and a child does to both of them. And they are historically, uh, they've been historically marked as well, right? I mean, in slavery, children are always separated. Uh, in concentration camps, they were separated. Um, and it's quite uh, insane to think that this has to happen. I mean, it doesn't have, but it happens still and here and now. Um, Gina or Estelle? It's a it's a really interesting question, um, and I hadn't realized how present it was in my work till you actually asked, <laughs> which was funny. Um, yeah, I, I guess I'll share also my screen for a second for reference. Um, and so this is a piece um, called Bodega. It's about Lissandro Guzman Feliz, which was a 15 year old who was um, murdered in the Bronx. And um, if you remember the case that went viral on social media, it was a case of mistaken identity. And so this piece was really me thinking about uh, the bodega as this place of intersection that really for me growing up felt safe, even though there's always something sketchy happening in and around the bodega. Um, and I think, <laughs> yes, Gina, it's not just the cat. No. <laughs> I think that, um, you know, this case, it, it really shocked not just the Bronx, but I think it, it shocked social media. Um, and it actually like, you know, made the police respond, right? The response was so quick only to find out kind of that um, the culprits or like the people who are responsible were also children who were also super young. Um, and in this, in this piece, I have a Time magazine about the border um, and it's a, a really dark, dark lit photo um, with a mother and child who are actually like being separated at the border. Um, it made me think about a lot of things uh, like who the paper is written for, who has access to it, who wants to see a photo like this. Um, even though I think it's important to take them, but it, it made me think about it specifically being on the Times Magazine. Um, you know, having like Mexican ancestry. Also, I think this, this story, it kind of felt aligned. Uh, so Junior migrated here, his, his family migrated here. We have a lot of migrants in the Bronx. Um, it's a big part of also like just being like Latino in the US. I feel even if you are born here, there's this constant disconnect uh, about feeling American. Um, and so there's so many aspects. I mean, but even just thinking about being what it means to be Latino, Latina, Latinx, um, I think that the mothers are really, I, I was talking about this earlier with a few friends actually, like mothers always seem to be the head of the household. Uh, <laughs> whereas I feel like uh, Western Europeans, it's like the guy wears the pants. I feel like for us, it's like the women are the ones who run the kind of dynamics within the family. Um, and so just really thinking about how important mothers are to families in terms of like nourishment, love and care. Um, I think this particular story struck me. It actually led me to make another piece I was just thinking about when Victoria was talking about um, of me and my nephew. Um, and, you know, I made this piece. It's really different than my other work. It's the first time faces appear. Um, and I think part of that was me really thinking about um, my experience navigating identity and kind of all the sociocultural aspects and things we have to kind of figure out uh, because of our complex identities and thinking about how I can change that experience for future generations. Uh, and I, I think as, as I get older, specifically as an artist, I, I'm constantly thinking about the youth with everything happening politically. And I, I think that was more apparent for me um, after the 2016 election when the figure entered my work. And I, Victoria, you brought that up, but um, I think it's so, this is such a great pairing. 
I feel of artists uh, and just thinking about the relationships between our work from three like very different perspectives. So yeah, that's that was kind of my uh, relationship. So, so do you have the image of Junior when you installed it next to the bodega? Yeah. Because it really changes. I, I wanted everyone to see that because it changes the context from being, you know, in a white cube of our screens to being a monument, really a street monument. I love this, how it looks out there. Yeah, yes. and thinking about memorial, you yeah. know, that that's a huge memorial mm -hmm. that grew in front of um, that specific bodega. And I think it's it's something that a lot of people related to, right? Like having a kid being out and kind of getting caught up um, where basically they thought he was a member of another gang. Um, and it was just cause, you know, I guess I had questions about whether it was uh, like what he was wearing. He was like in a tank top and shorts, but it's like, this is common kind of dress code <laughs> in the Bronx or is it how he looked? And so like, basically they felt that he looked like someone. Um, and I thought that was like, pretty scary considering that there's a lot of kids in the Bronx who look like Junior. And so it really made me think about the dynamics of stereotyping and identity um, and how far that can go. Thank you, Gina. Yeah, I think this is a great segue um, because um, Stella was just talking about mothers as this main figure in Latinx spaces um so my uh relation so and it's funny Estelle you and I were together when I did this body of work and you did the junior <laughs> we're, we were studio mates um so I was uh particularly looking in 2018 at, mo at motherhood and more um and the perspective of the personal. So um, actually this project that you're looking here at address is um, like where Loving Suits was con conceptualized. And to talk a little bit about that, I wanted to, for the first time, be pretty vulnerable with myself and, and my process. Um, so a little bit about this. Let me go first with the details. So these are these wearables I made from old clothing that my mom used when she was like a late teenager, early tw 20s. And then I stole as a teenager from her and wore it, wore it until my late 20s. So um, I came into this reconciliation after this psychotic break I experienced in late 2017. And I was coming to terms with the material effects of my mental health, like my actions, also like my diagnosis. And I'm an immigrant. I, um, I'm just about to turn 10 years in this country. <laughs> I don't know how I feel about that. Um, and my whole family's back home, right? So like a lot of the tensions of the privileges of me embodying this space, of me having ex access to mental health, um, so I, I wanted to go back to that relationship with my mother, um, a relationship that has been strained uh, for the most, most part of my life. And I wanted to look uh, at her for the first time through, through empathy. Like how much did the system fail her? How much did generational trauma had to do with my relationship with my mother? And how much of like the enforcing of violence was beyond her understanding of care and love practices. And, you know, um, when I started this work and I started sharing because I was like really vulnerable about these experiences when I, um, the open studios were happening, um, a lot of Caribbean feminized folks um, would talk about this motherly wound, um, like their relationship with their mothers and about how like this direct generation above them um, that were feminized too, like their mothers or like maternal figures in the household um, would induce a certain kind of harm towards them, but not towards like the male figures or the, the ones that were masculine around them. Um, and then this um, generation above them, so our grandmothers would be the ones that would show care and love 
But then like when we go and look into the relationship, our mothers and their grandmother like, and their mothers, they had the same like conditions of like violence. So um, I was really interested in like looking at this, like obviously, even though I was re being really vulnerable with myself, I saw that there was this generational like trauma that kept like repeating itself and why feminized folks that like feel the oppression of a patriarchal system um, and then like forced to be because in the Dominican Republic, um, most households are like the mother is like the head of the house household and usually it's single mothers. So why would this violence kept like keep being perpetuated by someone who's who the state and the system keeps like dismissing and like deeming not worthy. So I was like really thinking about how, like if I want to look at this trauma, I need to see like how does this system of distress gets reproduced. But I am tired of also like seeing trauma over and over again. Um, I feel that unfortunately um, media um, and especially with, with all the systemic killings of black folks in this country and in this, this world, it's all like, it's trauma porn. And like the images keep repeating in, in a loop and you go into your phone and it's the loop. So I wanted to look at love as the starting point, even though I'm dealing with that trauma and I'm dealing to try to understand these systems, this macro system, how does it permeate this family system where those who are vulnerable and those who are oppressed um, become the oppressor in certain, in certain ways. And I do believe that by talking, right? Like really sitting down with that wound and, and looking at it and having conversations um, and naming, I do believe in the, in the power of naming, we can start like changing things as Estelle said, like for the future. Like we, we, we know that unfortunately, maybe we won't like see the material like end of this work, but at the same time, like having this little moments of hope, right? Um, and quoting uh, Jose Esteban Munoz that talks about queer futurity, right? Like you think about in the present, we need to have these little spaces and moments of having a horizon where we believe that this is possible in the present and we enact that present. So going back to this work, like for me, particularly working through the material aspect, right? Like looking at this cloth that my mother like had, thinking about like the things that I would personally hold against her. Like she never taught me really how to use a sewing machine, for example. So I was like, well, first let me fix that. Like I can mother myself. I'm gonna buy a sewing machine and I'm gonna take this clothes and put it together. And then um, even taking, this is my mother um, embroidering these photographs. Here it says, que tanto de yo soy tu? So like how much of you am I? So thinking about even that, like, right? Like how much genetically has been passed down, how much like the system has taught me to embody this violence or, or deflect um, a lot of it back to her. Um, and then I would like, perform on these pieces, right? Like, how do I fit this perception of how motherly relationships should be, right? Like motherly love is should, supposed to be like this perfect thing. And again, I, I will bring it back to hooks. <laughs> she talks when she talks about like um, childhood and children and love, she does uh, address that. Like, unfortunately, a lot of us understand understanding of love is care. And the thing is that care and love, it's not necessarily the same thing in the sense of um, love should be, not, should never be coexistent with violence or with lack of something. And unfortunately in a lot of our um, societies and, and a lot of, I'm talking a lot about the Dominican Republic, we, we hit a child and we say like, it's because I love you. So, you know, like I'm even like, going to the minimum. And I do believe like going to that micro spaces, going to those like filial relationships, th those like first relationships. We, if we start to like 
deconstruct them, we can then like start addressing like a, a larger system. Because if we're wounded people walking around and reproducing violence in our everyday, how are we gonna attack like this whole system that preys upon us? But yeah, so I went really like down a rabbit hole. <laughs> It was really worth it. Thank you so much. Uh, it's quite an amazing, quite an amazing subject and quite an amazing approach to it. I also wanted to acknowledge that, you know, there is the stereotype that uh, that all feminist work is autobiographical. Well, in this case, not all. Gina, yours is. But in case of Victoria or Estelle, it is not. And it still touches to something that feels very personal, which I think is really interesting. Also, we're not talking motherhood here in the CIS context, right? We're querying motherhood and its concept. So I think that really how the three of you somehow approached, touched the subject was uh, very, very interesting for me uh, to see um, uh, and to be able to talk with you about it together. Um, now, I hope that everybody in the background start thinking about their questions and put them in Q&A, uh, because I have one more question. We will go um, and talk a little bit more, but I would like everyone to start thinking about what you would like to ask uh, Gina, Victoria, and Estelle. And in the meantime, I wanted to dive uh, into the material, into the material in which you work, meaning medium. And of course, all three of you work in textile. And I wanted to allow myself for a little uh, risky comparison between textile, like textile art as figuration versus fiber art as abstraction, which of course wouldn't hold necessarily in 100% of cases, but it does, it does say something about your practice, meaning all of you uh, involve um, textile and very often clothes and deal not only with identity this way, but you also um, use it as a way to document uh, communities, worlds that you live in, and also you engage communities. All three of you engage communities to work with you through working in textile. And I thought it's quite amazing that there are so many similarities, even though your work really don't look alike at all when, when you see it. Who'd like to start uh, on that? I'll jump in, especially because you said engaging communities and, and documenting, and I'm like, me? Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> um, okay, let me share this. So um, it's funny because uh, as we were talking, I'm like, oh shit, there's so many parallels. So thank you so much, Monica and Ian and Eva. Like, this is amazing. Um, so talking about abstraction and figuration and, and the textile, um, I'm gonna start with this one, which is also what I have in the back. This is one of the bellizas. Um, I started using textile with this work, with bellizas. And bellizas are this, Dominican rag rug, like it's a traditional rag rug that um, exists in the campo and the countryside. And it's a really like, it's a fe feminized uh, work where like women are the ones that usually perform it. And historically, unfortunately, there's not a lot of information about it, but um, it's like upcycling. So also this is all upcycled uh, pieces of cl old clothing or remnants of, of like, fabric that th are thrown away. So I wanted to look at this like uh, cultural uh, practice and look at labor, look at conversations around memory and culture, um, anti-Blackness in the Dominican Republic. So a lot of like, I use this as the site of production of these conversations. So this is a really like you uh, hand weave it with your hand and I was really interested in seeing like what happens when we engage collective labor and we are collectively with people that we don't know, a uh, random community, just like weaving and allowing for conversations to like evolve. And this one over here specifically was in 2016, made in El Centro Leon in, uh, in Santiago. But each one of them, like this one was in, um, a natural hair salon in the Dominican Republic. This one over here was in 
um, a market in Santiago, so a public market, and this one was in the only state school in Santo Domingo. So I, I used the site and the people that I engage as trying to document like what happens when you have like this really hard labor. These are really big. These are um, eight feet by 3.5, I think, feet. And what happens when you're just putting put people together, making this stuff without like any means more than like learning a tradition that everyone can recognize in the Dominican Republic. And you allow to, I feel that, you know, because you're engaged in something like all of a sudden, you don't have the, the, the pressures of judging others because you're all there together and you don't know who's doing this. You only know like this random person has this huge tarp and it's like, hey, you want to learn how to do a pedisa? So I was really interested in seeing what happens and document also the labor. So the ones that are colorful that are not yellow were during performance and these are over 20 people being engaged in the labor and um, on 10 hours of performance. And these are the colorful ones. The other ones that are yellow uh, were outside of performance time. And it was like made by me and some friends that I bribed with pizza um, and over 20 hours of labor to complete the others. So also like, I was really interested in like, okay, how do you document the feminized labor that is like completely underpaid in the Dominican Republic and you bring it to spaces where these people don't even like know how much it takes. Yet you also like enter like race and all the intersections of Dominican um, living that you don't have a space to really sit down and talk to other perspectives about, especially in the age of so social media. Um, and then of course, like these, this is one of the sculptures that I have in the show. I'm trying to zoom in, I can't, okay. Um, all of these again, upcycled, it's really funny, Victoria and Estelle also upcycling stuff and finding stuff. So thank you, Mar Materials for the Arts for this one. <laughs> um, also, uh, 99 cent stores are really a place where I sort a lot of my materials. And I feel that because also me as, a, as an artist, I only have studio spaces whenever I am in a residency. Um, the practicality of fiber art and being able to, for example, if I am doing this embroidery, I can do it in the train while I'm commuting to work. If I am, um, I don't know, like taking classes on Zoom University, I can be really engaging on my practice and take the time and take it with me wherever. Um, so I feel that that was like what pushed me beyond like also the fact that, you know, I was taught to embroider when I was like 12 because my mom thought that would be like a great asset as a wife for me to know how to embroider like the 1800s. Um, and yeah, I feel like also like a little rebellion from it, right? Like, oh yeah, this is for me to embroider the towels for my husband. No, I'm gonna embroider panties and put little pan palm trees on them. So yeah, I feel like, Honestly, I still do painting sometimes, but fiber art and like textile, it's my favorite thing for real. Victoria, in your case, in your practice, uh, the choice of material and playing with textile and with fiber uh, really has a global aspect to it. So yeah, let's delve into it. Yeah, I mean, I think I was I was also quite drawn to Tina talking about her work with the community because um, my current project um, also has an aspect where I've been working with immigrant community to create a large woven textile piece. Um, I'm going to share the screen, just maybe I could share some work in progress images. Um, Just gonna, yeah, some of um, some work in progress images. So again, also questioning notions of labor and thinking about immigrants as you know, most of the labor force in the capitalist system that we find ourselves today. 
I have, you know, I, I work a lot with repairs clothing, so a lot of secondhand clothing. And of course, I started investigating the histories of secondhand clothing when I was in Nigeria about a decade ago. Um, and I was drawn to this material. My very first training was in tailoring. And then my first degree was in painting. But of course, with painting, it got to a point where I was really questioning painting, you know, studying the history of painting and not finding myself in the history of painting that we know today. And, you know, and I started, you know, trying to figure out the material that I wanted to work with. And textile came to me naturally um, because already I was working in textile, tailoring and designing clothes. And so I started working with, you know, secondhand clothing. I was, I mean, secondhand clothing specifically because I was, very curious about where this clothing were coming from. And I grew up wearing secondhand clothing. My parents would buy them for me. And I was wondering where are these clothes coming from? How did they get here? And so I started a research into secondhand clothing. And some of the things I found out was that secondhand clothing actually started getting imported to a country like Nigeria in the 60s. And of course, this was early post-colonial Nigeria when the, you know, the elites from the society would travel, they would bring back this clothing into, into the Nigerian market. But also at the same time, I, some of the most interesting thing was reading about um, the early fashion designer in, the, in Nigeria, someone like you know, Shari Th uh, Thomas Fayum, who had the very first um, fashion design um, outfit, her very first tailoring outfit in Lagos. And she was narrating how difficult it was to convince Nigerians at the time to wear the traditional clothing. But you know, think about it, it was early 60s, it was, early post-colonial Nigeria, everybody wanted to be, you know, um, everyone we were alluding to national um, modernism, everyone wanted to, to dress like the white man, if you will. And so people would rather go for most important Western clothing than wear traditional outfit. And so I started collecting secondhand clothing. I did the research, I traveled across different countries in Africa, I went to West, around West Africa and East Africa. And I realized we had very similar situations where you have this huge and immense amount of secondhand clothing getting you know, shipped into Nigeria, um, into Af countries in Africa. Um, and, you know, and I wanted to, you know, so for me, this material at this point has become what I call my power object, where I just, you know, I repurpose them in different way I create, um, textile and um, woven textile. I use various techniques from weaving to threading, you know, all of which I learned naturally growing up in Nigeria. And so as part of my project, um, you know, working with immigrants has been using the labor in intensive process of weaving this clothing and in some cases stitching them together to create this large scale installation um, where we're also thinking about the label process, you know, you, this is in relation to Gina talking about label forces and also using it as a met metaphor in addressing notions of label force as associated with immigrants, as we understand a context like America, the capitalist system would probably fail if it did not have the label force to produce the work. Um, so I'm interested in sort of, you know, teasing all of this out in my work. Um, and so also overall, I think um, at this point in time, having trained as a tello, a painter, my MFA was in sculpture, new genres. Um, at this point, I work mostly with, you know, very interdisciplinarily, where most of these various trainings, you know, sort of come into play into one project. So one project could be sound, like, you know, like this project on immigration, I have the sound elements, which is a collected stories, shared stories from most of my collab uh, collaborators. I have the woven um, pieces, I have the large scale sculptures. All of this comes full cycle at this time in my work. Thank you. Great. Thank you, um, Estelle. It's like every time each of you talk, I'm like, wait, wait, wait. I just want to like join the conversation. Um, so many connections. S similarly, Victoria, just like looking at art history, um, I didn't feel I connected with it at all. And I, I started to look at objects that I did connect with. It's interesting how like my relationship to textiles, I feel is um, so different from both of you. Uh, so my mom's not a sewer. She didn't sew things. <laughs> my parents grew up in Harlem. They're super New York. Um, and, you know, my relationship to clothing, I mean, to textiles really came through clothing. Um, and I feel that fashion is such a big part 
of being in New York. And it's a way in this kind of like saturated, um, crowded space to really identify yourself. Um, and I think it's something that people play with in New York. I remember when I first went on my first interview as a teen, it was at Foot Locker. <laughs> and um, I didn't know if I should wear dress shoes or sneakers. I was like, what is the vibe here? And um, just thinking about how much textiles kind of played into that. But also, and I'll share my screen, um, also thinking about accessibility. Accessibility was a really important um, thing to me when I started studying art and realizing how, uh, you know, no one I knew could connect with a lot of, a lot of the concepts and things I was reading about and seeing in museums. I didn't feel personally I could connect to a certain degree until I, you know, learned about the history of, of, of fine art. Um, Let's go to the slide so that the image is larger because we see your whole- Oh, sorry, yeah. Oops, nope. No, not here. <laughs> <laughs> Technical difficulties. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So yeah, I, I really started to think about fashion and um, the idea of identity and clothes. Um, you know, as a kid, um, there was just like a common saying is like, kind of like, uh, you dress your kids well, so people know that they're taken like care of at home. So it's like, you know, that really kind of stuck with me, the idea of the craze over brands and kind of the things we associate to brands. Um, someone's wearing like Nike, they're so athletic or they're so hip. And so like thinking about that and even the shift to secondhand clothing, um, which again, I have a different perspective on uh, where it became cool in New York to go thrift shopping because of the access to uh, cheaper branding, branded clothes this shift of uh, Nike and Jordan being a really popular street brand uh, that I felt I couldn't wear when I went to college that became repopularized, um, but they had to be dirty. You know, all of these different layers to this um, that kind of shift based on the context. And, you know, I think a big part of that that I maybe haven't said was uh, really thinking about my own identity. And it's a really important piece to this and thinking about how I was perceived differently based on the spaces I occupied. And it's, it's something um, that I think I'm continuing to dig for in my work. And I mean, thinking about Latinx identity in general, um, I think firstly as this composite identity, right, of indigenous, uh, African and people from Spain, but also thinking about how Latinas are all grouped together, right? All of these different cultures in different places that were colonized by Spain suddenly must share all of these um, cultural experiences, uh, which I find, especially growing up in New York, specifically in the Bronx, um, my experience is so different. Um, just at the basic level, not being super fluent in Spanish, never have visiting Puerto Rico. And so like all of these things begin to shift, like who and how I connect. Um, and so that's what really makes me think about perception. I mean, this piece, um, and I like thinking about uh, places of intersection that seem to carry these cultural stereotypes. So like here with the supermarket, when we see Goya, when we see Bustelo, uh, there's a specific identity that kind of follows, except, you know, I know so many people, so many different backgrounds who are buying Goya beans and Bustelo coffee. And again, my experience is very limited to New York. Um, but in regards to textile, also thinking about the home and how all of these components of my identity uh, kind of feel like they're from other cultures and other places, just because I grew up in New York. And so, I remember when I was in the residency in Florida, um, I had a fabric that I had gotten. Um, it was a place that was kind of like material for the arts in West Palm Beach, except, you know, the materials that were there were very fancy. Uh, <laughs> I thought it was hilarious. And uh, I found a bunch of textiles that I was really attracted to. Um, and thinking about how those textiles kind of carry culture. There were textiles I was familiar with. And I remember uh, I had a few families pass by. I had one family pass by and they were so excited. And they were like, hey, that that textile, that is African, right? And I was like, I'm pretty sure. I was like, <laughs> I'm pretty sure. But just thinking about um, 
how important it is to trace back these things, but then also how they change over time. And, and that's me also thinking about my own identity through migration, through generation. Um, I was reading this Romare Bearden article and talking about the idea of trying to uh, figure out nuanced identity and how it really is this composite of cultures and places. Um, and yeah, so it's, it's, I think my relationship to textile is me trying to figure out um, what I look like in regards to all these objects that seem to be coming from all these places, uh, like Gina's describing, right? Like that are manufacturing them um, and really being kind of like, not being able to see that process. And so, so what is the relationship to these things? Um, but yeah, so that's, that's kind of. Thank you. You really um, ended on the note on which I kind of like wanted to land to acknowledge how incredibly uh, in this conversation, the local, the locality and the globality come together and just constantly you know, go and cross their paths. Uh, we're in the Bronx and we are in Nigeria and we are in deep colonial uh, times in uh, DR and everywhere else at the same time. It's, it's really very powerful to think about, you know, the materials, the, the labor behind materials, both in terms of people uh, and how the work is organized and has been organized during the last 500 years around the world, but also in terms of where the materials come from and how they are shipped and all of it together um, is powerful. I'm trying to uh, 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 impress the audience to come up with uh, questions. We have the first one, so I'm gonna um, read the question. It's not easy to read. This one is for Gina uh, from Irina. Uh, thank you for this amazing panel. Uh, my question is for Gina. I was really fascinated by the image you presented of you working on your pieces as you travel in public transportation, or as you put it, the possibility of taking your work with you. And now, correct me if I'm wrong, one of those pieces is behind you, maybe at home. I was wondering about this pre-lives and after, sorry, pre-lives and afterlives of your pieces, the moments before they were exhibited and moments after. Are those spaces, times, opening opportunities for other communities to form around your work? Do they have other ways of doing? Do they trigger other effects that then, that, uh, then are incorporate, reincorporated into your work? Gina, mm -hmm. take it, <laughs> take it away. Um, yeah, so that is a great, yes, this is actually one of the pellizas that was in El Centro Leon. So let me see if you can see the whole thing. There you go. And um, they have been everywhere and they have actually um, existed outside of, you know, my wall as a Zoom background. Um, and actually I have some photos I have right here. I'm gonna share quickly. So you can see some of the spaces where the, the pellizas have existed. Um, so this was at my residency in, um, with the laundromat project at Kelly Street. So for example, one day we had this activity for like using it as a prop, like a, como se dice eso? A backdrop for photos, for example. So you see it here, this is one of them. Um, I have also used it as a space, like holding a space and community um since like these are really sturdy like this thing you throw in a washing machine and it's ready it's clean it's it's on tarp and it's really durable so i um i do not sell these works for example and this is something that i have talked uh with monica before but i envisioned this as continuing to hold spaces for communities here's another photo of um, late, like this was last summer and you can see one of the um, loving suits here. So I like mix, they also like have crossovers as Victoria also has with her work. Like all of a sudden like Fajisa comes with loving suits. So the afterlives of these projects and here I wanted to show like how the collective happens and doing Fajisas is to always like ho hold a physical space or a visual space for um, communities to continue to come together. And of course this uh, happens a lot of times if 
I am granted spaces <laughs> for these to exist. But usually when I have workshops, which um, as a teaching artist, I do a lot of times, I do use my pejizas. Um, there's three of these, two other, I think it's eight in total. And they like, they become like the place map for community to come together. So the afterlives of these pieces is all over the place. Um, also decoration. Thank you. We have a little shy audience, I think. Uh, I wonder if uh, maybe Nell uh, or Eva or Ian has a question to you or you have a question to each other that we could address before we... Um, there's, there's another, another question. question. There is a question in Q&A, okay. And we also have one in the chat, I think. So we have two currently. Oh, awesome. Okay, so the one we've in Q&A is for uh, Victoria from Rejoice. I'm really interested in the idea of secondhand clothes and its proliferation in current day. Several Instagram profiles are profiting off the secondhand clothing and it has become a viable means of sust sustenance. However, I'm really interested in your thoughts on the mass reproduction of items by the ABBA sellers in Nigeria and how they project this item as originally made elsewhere instead of fully accounting for their creativity. Do you use this as taking back ownership and agency of the trade or do you think this proliferates further issues? Great question. Um, that's a good question. Um, and first of all, my interest in the Secondhand clothing is beyond just the material, right? I'm interested as well in the histories of this clothing. So every clothing that you pick up, the clothing that I wear, it's not just a clothing that I got from the store because it has histories, it has memories. It's so I'm interested in how this history gets transported from one location to another, and how a local in Nigeria buying the same clothing and wearing it. So just sort of adds on to that history or, or complicates that history, if you will. So I'm very interested in all of that. And um, when you're talking about local production in Nigeria and how much they would accept that their local production is met in a different places, that is really a post-colonial problem um, when you are in a context where um, everything local has always been written about as not being good enough. And everyone is looking out, outward to import, to bring. So um, for example, you have uh, middle-class Nigerians, in some cases, even rich Nigerians would go to the secondhand clothing market to find quote unquote American designers where they wanna wear buy the Gucci's of this world. They wanna wear, you know, um, the Nike's of this world. And they would rather buy a secondhand Nike than patronize um, a local um, production from Aba in Nigeria like you mentioned. And so, and again, I mean, we cannot have this conversation without thinking about China and the role of China in complicating all of this narrative and really disrupting all of this narrative because the supposedly Nike, that is American brand was produced in China. And so um, we can't really have, you know, so I'm very interested in this global economy and how, how dominant culture really impacts cultural identity within the local economy or subcultures, if you will. Um, and these are things that I'm interested in teasing out in the work. And of course, even Nigeria, and also I have to mention, um, I just remember that secondhand clothing in Nigeria is considered contraband goods. So le legally, they're not supposed to be imported into the country, but we still have abundance of them. And so through the porous borders, you have all of these clothes coming in. Sometimes they ship them through Benin Republic that shares border with Lagos and they end up in Nigeria. And also from my research, I realized in the seventies, um, Nigeria used to produce a lot of textiles. So the textile production accounted for a huge amount of Nigerian economy. And that was in the you know, 70s, 80s where they had over 200 textile production companies. But today I'm not sure if we have up to five functional ones. So in essence, Every clothing that we wear, whether the supposedly traditional local, they're all coming from someplace else. And so I am very interested in all of those complicated histories and how our and how all of that impacts who we are, our identities culturally and otherwise. You know, and I, you know, I like to tease all of that out in the work. So for me, those are yeah. Thank you. 
There's been so much about perception, being perceived, the gaze. The, the, uh, we didn't get to this as a subject, but I knew it would just, your work is so soaked with it that everybody would, would get it. Um, let's look at the question in um, here in the chat, which is a little bit to Gina, but I think that also Estelle can, um, can uh, respond to this as well. Thank you very much for this board. I have a question for everyone. The word affection, afecto in Spanish is regularly not mentioned much in our talks as a community. And I want to ask about um, how affect intervenes in your process. Thanks to Gina's work as a Dominican, I was able to reach certain conclusions about the ways in which these pieces invite us to recognize the affection that is wanted to be delivered behind each act of resistance. Gina, you want to start and then we'll have Estelle respond? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so, affecto. I think that there's, um, I'm trying to remember who said, um, talking about like affection and, and how also like it becomes an act of resistance, especially when we think about how we, and, and this capitalist society and in this society, affection is um, intimate. And we do not hold like beyond those, um, if we have, we're intimate with someone, we do not hold affection towards others. Um, and I feel that sometimes, especially when um, I, I come from some um, spaces, uh, sort of like political spaces, um, there it's true. There's not like a talk when we're talking about um, liberation when we're talking and I'm talking specifically in the Dominican Republic um, and where I have existed um, as a Marxist youth, um, there was little talk about affection and love and these as tools for our liberation. And I feel that sometimes when we like stay in the dialectics and we stay on this like really um, pompous discourse that is not contained within the material uh, realities of like this decolonial um, worldview. Like you do not have talk about love and like affect or, or, or affect, like affect wouldn't be like really affect, but you know, um, it's really interesting. Thank you, Jaisa, for bringing that up. Um, I think that I do have to say, I have seen a lot of talks around um, holding like intimacy with other people outside of, you know, this romantic notion. Um, of course, <laughs> right away, I'm like a little bit afraid because we know how neoliberalism like co-opted like this languages and repackages it and sells it to us. And it like loses sometimes that shine of, you know, revolutionary praxis. But I, you know, I do have to say like from this last 10 years, the talks around holding affecto for our communities and really like understanding how the haptics, how like touch and the senses are really important for our connections as humans. And hence also for our liberation from the system that wants to like deprive us of these um, connections. You know, I'm, I'm a little bit hopeful, even if it's kind of dark out there. Estelle? Uh, yeah, it's it's funny. I'm currently making a piece of my parents embracing, <laughs> and <laughs> I um, it's because I came here uh, to New Haven, and I was thinking about um, which parts of my identity stay with me um, when I leave a place. Uh, thinking about place and how connected it is to identity, um, and part of that is like the love we share amongst like family and people, which I think is, is so much a part of like affection in general is so much a part of Latina culture. Like, <laughs> you know, like we're huggers, we're kissers, like, you know, um, my aunt touches my butt any chance she gets and it's not weird, you know, and it's, <laughs> it's just a part of the culture. And, um, yeah, I think about love a lot in my work. I think first and foremost is a love for the Bronx, which I, I'll be honest, it took me leaving and going to college to come back with that mentality um, of how much I love it here. 
Um, I think often when you're in a place, it's sometimes it's difficult, especially challenging places to see the beauty in them. Um, but I think coming back really allowed me to make work even in, about the architecture, like love for the architecture, love for the history of the Bronx, um, which has such a rich history. Um, one of the first boroughs actually to be created, the greenest borough in New York. People don't talk about that. Um, so, I mean, there, there's a lot of different ways. I think even um, when I do have shows um, and symbolism and iconography as well make its way into the work, you know, I, I'm looking at the piece of my parents and um, thinking about like the evil eye earring that my mom is wearing, um, which I think adornments also on the figures are ways for me to show affection, um, which is interesting uh, and, and just showing items, objects, and spaces that I think are not normally um, considered aesthetically pleasing, right? Like the grunginess of New York comes up, comes up a lot when people talk about my work. Um, and for me, there's something really beautiful about it. Uh, but again, you know, it kind of took me to take a step back. It wasn't when I was on the train that I had this epiphany. Um, but I think also in terms of showing, um, I'm always looking for ways to bring students. I I'm also an educator. So I worked with pre-K through third for a long time. Um, what it means to like care for a neighborhood, to care for a space, but also taking into consideration how specifically in low-income communities, um, there's not a sense of ownership over space. And that's partly why these communities are treated and look this way. Um, and I think it's a really complex relationship. But yeah, I think about love a lot. And also in the form of, you know, I've done shows where I'll give out prints to locals uh, for free, even if the prints are, I'm charging for them. So like, I think there's different ways um, I think about showing affection. Um, and one of those ways is, is showing objects that I think people in my community um, who grew up possibly not having access to fine arts uh, can access. So thinking about things like graffiti, thinking about things like photography, um, handcrafted objects. So. Thank you. 726 and we are about to round it up and I could um, basically do that now, but I have an instinct of running through the first part of the last question, which is very complex, but it has a very interesting beginning. Uh, the question is about uh, whether you treat your, your, consider your work primarily installation or a documentation of that engagement with the community. And that's the kind of question we never almost think uh, in, in the context of installations, but usually about uh, in the context of performance. And I thought it's actually worth asking it aloud. Uh, we have three minutes. So if each of you would like to chip just one, two sentences of an instinctive answer to this, I think it's worth for all of us to, to um, stay with this question uh, as we part ways. Victoria, you have to unmute yourself. All of you have to unmute yourself. Okay, so context is very important. I mean, um, I have to mention that um, my practice started in, started in Nigeria and I know how much my work shifted when I had the very first residency and moved to Europe to work. And just being in that context really changed the way I thought about my work. Just walking around the museums, engaging some of the portraiture I was seeing, um, the historical portraitures, um, you know, thinking about some of the uh, modern artworks I was seeing, really shifted the way I started thinking about my work. And so context is very, very important um, in my work. So the notion of relocating work, um, so my piece, I mean, I don't see them as photography. For me, photographic projects exist in my work because sometimes I also create, I didn't show any work in that line, but sometimes I create using this repurposed material, the secondhand clothing. I do also create costumes and those costumes get activated with bodies um, through performances or photography. And sometimes they just exist as sculptures. Um, and so I mean, maybe while I'm doing that, I could do a quick screen share of that just so we see one of, just give an instance. Um, and so context matters. And these pieces are created in this space. They end up sometimes outdoors. Um, sometimes they end up in, you know, museum spaces, gallery spaces, or even outdoor. Um, this piece, for example, was actually situated in a secondhand clothing market because I had done all of this work 
in galleries and spaces. And at some point I was interested in going to the location where this product actually comes from. And this is one of the biggest secondhand clothing markets in Lagos in Badagri, uh, which is closer, is a town closer to the border where most of this clothes come in. Um, and I wanted to go to the market, engage with the market people. So within the secondhand clothing market, for example, you have tellers who transform clothing for people. Maybe you bought a shirt and it's ripped and you needed it, you know, taken care of, you have tellers readily available. And so I wanted to work with these women, most of them women, to transform this work, which was mostly done in a, the national color green, which is a national Nigerian color. Um, and, you know, they ended up, you know, transforming this large um, green shirt into this large sculpture that I installed around um, the marketplace. So again, this was installed in the market. But one of the things I have to highlight in wrapping up is most of the dealers in the market at some point when they saw us with cameras and doing this work, number one, they thought we came from the government and they thought maybe we came to disrupt your market. Some of them thought we came from the movie industry. So they were trying to understand who we are, why we were there and why we were doing what we were. So in some ways for me, it was interesting to have people who normally would not go to the galleries trying to, you know, interacting with the work, trying to understand the work. And, you know, and in, in fact, we had really, really interesting conversations in our market. So at the end of the day, I also collected sound from the market. And so by the time the piece got to the gallery, I had the sound accompanying the piece. And I'm just gonna wrap it up there. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> I don't want to uh, take the space from Gina and Estelle, but if you could just, uh, um, make a very quick comment on installation versus documentation in your practice? Estelle? Yeah, I think that's uh, a big question mark. It was like one of the real motivating factors for me actually to like pursue grad school. Uh, I think a lot of my work happens in, uh, a lot of the, there's the play with the material that happens with me in the studio, which is mostly intuitive. There's the collecting that happens outside, which is in, engaged in community, but not directly with the community. And then they're sharing the work, which I think is uh, there's self, self reflection and communal reflection that happens there. And I, it's the part that I really enjoy that kind of motivates me to make the work that I haven't figured out how I share that. And I think part of it is because um, it's creating comfortable spaces where people can talk and reflect and think, and if whether they want to share or not, whether they want that to be public or not. Um, I tried something when I was a studio mate with Gina, where I put up a paper and let people write it out, and I didn't. I didn't feel that I got the same results from that that I do in conversation with folks. Um, so, but I, I would say that context matters. Most of the time I've shown my work, it's been in local spaces, not necessarily in the white cube. Um, and I think I'm challenged by that, these works existing in the white cube or existing in museums. And it's something that I'm navigating. I will say, I think being in a space like an institution um, makes me approach the work differently, uh, where I think I create more work that's uh, about my relationship to my identity in regards to community opposed to about the community directly. And so it's a tricky question. Context changes everything, I think. It's, and generations before you fought against this context. Gina. Facts. <laughs> you have I the feel, right words. It's, it's, I feel like um, because of context, uh, things do change so much and in my work. Like, yes, like the Padisas are like a material um, documentation of the labor, right? And 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 then some Padisas, I even color code like time of labor and hours of labor and individuals. And I have like even like reading like codes. Um, but the reality is that if you do not have this information sometimes, and it has happened when I exhibit this, um, people will uh, focus on the materiality of the piece instead of the, the actual labor and, and, you know, like the performance behind it, right? Like for me, it's really tricky and it's something that I, always have to be thinking about with my uh, pro my projects because I do see my work as projects, not like individual pieces necessarily, unless I do like one painting. Um, and a lot of it is thinking about that too. Like if it's being exhibited in this space, what community comes here? Um, how will people interact with the piece? How much context can I give? Um, because even though, uh, in art school, 
I was told a lot, like, you know, like not to be um, educating people, um, even though sometimes, you know, people would not really understand what I am trying to say um, because of being a Dominican. I think that it is really a push and pull that you have as an artist. And sometimes you just have to understand that, you know, it will do what it does whenever you put it in a context. Um, but keeping control of it, understanding what it means for you to create like commodities or create these projects, who are you engaging with, is something that we have to keep in mind. But yeah, why not both? It's a documentation and an installation and whatever <laughs> it requires at the moment. And an experience, an exchange. Yeah exchange thank you very much for this exchange i think i think it was wonderful it was wonderful for me and i'm very very grateful for your sharing uh your art and your ideas uh i think uh to everyone who joined us tonight and especially uh the bronx museum and the curators eva davis and ian Koffer, uh who curated the show uh, a short reminder to everyone the next two conversations are going to be on wednesdays i believe february 16th and 23rd if i didn't uh if i did hear it correctly go to the museum's website or instagram and you will learn it and first of all go and see the exhibition which is which is quite uh, an exciting show uh, more wonderful artists like Gina, Estelle, and Victoria are participating in it. Thank you, everyone, and have a good night. Good night everyone. Yes, thank you so much for joining. Um, and Monica was completely correct. We have two more of these talks coming up in February, one a week from today and one in two weeks. So you can sign up for those at bronxmuseum.org. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us. And of course, thank you so much, uh, Monica, Victoria, Gina, and Estelle for this wonderful talk. And uh, have a great night, everybody. Thank you. Good night.